My name is Terry Covey, and I'm the pastor of Twin Oaks Baptist Church. This message that you are about to hear was delivered at Twin Oaks. We pray that it will be a blessing to you, and if there are any questions that you may have or any way that we may be of help to you, please feel free to contact us. God bless you, and have a great day. If you have your Bibles, Luke chapter 11. There's a prayer in the Bible that almost every one of us knows. And uh, it seems like the church, sometimes we take extremes one direction or the other. Some churches maybe would recite this prayer every Sunday, which is certainly not wrong. The only problem with that sometimes is repetition, too much repetition makes something become a ritual. And in response to that, because some churches maybe have made uh, what we call the Lord's Prayer a ritual, then other churches don't pray it at all. And so I want us just to, to say it here together as we start out in our study today and just, uh, just you probably know it by heart and we'll say, uh, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those, you know, sometimes we get to that part, we're not sure we're supposed to say debts or trespasses, we'll say trespasses there at that part, but let's say it together and think about the words as you're saying them. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and forever. Amen. The version there in Luke is a little bit different than the version in Matthew, and so there's a little bit of question exactly when Jesus, apparently at least on two occasions, gave this prayer to his disciples, and so what we just recited is more in Matthew than it is here in Luke. Matthew's gospel also includes that little part at the end, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever, amen, which actually comes out of First Chronicles 29. It's a part of a prayer that David prayed as they were preparing to build the temple. This week, uh, actually I start on Sunday evenings most time thinking about what I'm going to preach on the next Sunday. And so most of the time I spend, I spend some time every day on a Sunday morning service. One reason it takes me that long to get a sermon together. And then secondly, I want to try to internalize it as much as I can. I'm not just trying to teach something to you, but I'm trying to learn myself, and especially in this matter of prayer. And so when I felt that God was leading me to preach and teach on prayer, I kind of started forming a, a, a outline of subjects that I felt like needed to be covered. And I pray asking the Spirit to guide me I really have a very difficult time preaching something unless I feel like that is the message for that Sunday. It doesn't always come out the way that I want it to, but I always strive to, I believe in, in the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And so I strive very much for the Holy Spirit to lead me. And, and sometimes I, he lets me know way ahead of time. And sometimes, I'm sometimes Sunday morning, I'm still trying to figure out exactly where he's leading. It just goes, but that's okay as long as he's leading. And I felt like that the Holy Spirit was leading me to teach at least on the first part of this prayer because I sense in my spirit that the Holy Spirit is trying to, to not just, just gain knowledge about, you know, uh, prayer which is easy to do. Sometimes it's easy just to gain knowledge. But James says, you know, if you just gain knowledge and you don't apply it, you're like somebody looking into a mirror that sees that you need to comb your hair and then you turn around and you walk away. And I think what's the sad thing is a lot of times we come to church and a song or a message or something speaks to us and then we just brush it off, and, and which is bad. It's sad. One, it's disobedience, but secondly, we're missing what God wanted to say to us that day. And so I believe that the Holy Spirit, I sense that he's trying to take us on a journey in prayer. And he's actually, I think, trying to bring us eventually to that point of the first message I preached to where we actually realize we are in the Holy of Holies with God, praying 
And so there's, there's a journey to get there. And I felt like today that one of the things the Holy Spirit wanted me to, to help us try to think through and internalize is why are we praying and what are we praying about? And so I've titled today's message, Kingdom Praying. Kingdom Praying. Why do I say that? Well, as we go through this prayer, and, and, and if you read through the prayer, Luke or Matthew, either one, as, as you go through this, and, you know, in the King James Version, it includes a little more than some other translations, but verse 2, you know, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as, as it is in heaven. That's part A. Then you kind of come to part B in this prayer. Give us day by day or this day our daily bread forgive us our sins for as we forgive those who so it goes on then it's about us and this prayer now these are not two prayers put together this is a prayer and I believe that Jesus is trying to teach us a proper sequence to prayer in order to pray according as God would have us to pray and to pray in such a way that God will not only hear our prayers but answer our prayers I think that one of the reasons we fail to pray is because we fail to see answer answers to our prayers and maybe the reason sometimes we fail to see answers to our prayers is because we're not really praying in a way that God wants us to pray in our laid back day and age, you know, we kind of just want to do everything. We kind of want to form everything and look at everything. There is no authority over us in the world, right, today. Don't tell me what to do. You know, and many of us, we were raised in the hippie generation, and so now we're passing it down to our kids, and we wonder why what's going on in the world because we're breeding it into them. We're demonstrating it sometimes by the way we respond to authority. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. And so we're raising up a bunch of, you know, anyhow, it's a whole different message, isn't it? But this prayer, I think part of this prayer, that the first principle that Jesus is trying to lay down in this prayer is that really, you know, people ask me sometimes, the other day somebody asked me, why should we pray? And I'll tell you what I think is one of the reasons why we should pray is because prayer is part of God's means to bring us back under his authority. When we go to prayer, God is trying to, to help us to take our life, our situations, our problems, our concerns, our hopes, our dreams, God is trying to help us take all of these things that we deal with on a daily basis and then God is trying to say to us, okay, here's how now to take your life here on this earth and bring it in under my authority. And I think that one of the first things Jesus is trying to teach us is how to have a heavenly perspective on life. Jesus talks about, uh, you know, we're praying, our Father, which art in heaven. That's kind of a weird combination. In a way, you know, Father, it's almost like, see, if I was writing this prayer, here's how, let me rephrase that. Here's how I pray this prayer a lot of times. Our Father, which art in heaven, forgive us our sins. Give us this day our daily bread. Lead us not into temptation. Amen. Now, what's the problem with that prayer? I totally jump over the first part of it. I don't even talk about God's kingdom, God's name, God's will. I just kind of take it as, Father, here am I. You know, take care of me. There's two approaches to praying. The first approach, and I think it's not just an approach to praying, but it's, it's a philosophy of life. And, and I think sometimes we do this and we don't even realize we're doing this, is that we put ourselves as the center of everything. And therefore, we even approach prayer in that way. And, and I, I can prove it to you real quickly. Next time you're somewhere where they're taking prayer requests, just listen to what people ask as a prayer request. It's all about us. And we have a right to pray about our needs. Jesus teaches that. But also, Jesus is teaching us that, you know, some call this the Lord's Prayer. Some call this a model prayer prayer a pattern for prayer and if that is so you know Matthew's gospel Jesus said pray in this manner here's a it doesn't mean that you pray these words exactly 
doesn't necessarily mean that you have a checklist. Okay, I, I prayed, I called God Father in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. No, it's not even that. I think it's Jesus is trying to lay down principles for us to pray by, to form our prayer so that we're praying in a way that that's, it's God's will that God will answer. But the problem with it is many times if we will think about how we pray and listen to how we pray, most of our prayer is about us. And I think we unconsciously sometimes, we've got God out here somewhere on a string And we don't even really think about praying about and who God is. And matter of fact, this is one of the reasons that we are so inconsistent in our praying is because we don't pray unless we think we need God to do something. Right or wrong? You know? We don't even really pray until it's desperate time and then it's like, God, I need you to do this. And I think the problem with that kind of praying, number one, we will be inconsistent with our praying, and there is a good chance that we may be praying outside of the will of God. And it says in 1 John chapter 5 that God is going to answer his prayers, our prayers that are within his will. You see, prayer is not about us going to God and informing God of the problem and then telling God what is the solution and then saying, God, fix it. That is not what prayer is about. Prayer is about taking who we are, our life, the situations that God allows to come into our lives, and then going to God and bringing those situations, whatever they are, the problems, the, the pain, the concerns, the fears, the whatever it is. Taking those and then bringing those back to our Father, praise God, who's in heaven, who's in control, who has the ability to do something, and it's laying on them, putting them back with under, in perspective to his authority, to his will. We oftentimes approach prayer in, in this, this way, but actually, I think what Jesus is teaching us is that he wants us to approach prayer, and because prayer, our relationship with God, in this way, God, it's about God. I mean, you know, even as I say that, I'm thinking, you're thinking, yeah, yeah, it's about God. I hear that a thousand times. How can I say it that we would actually take it in? Who created who? Who gave life to who? Who's in control? Who's eternal? Who has the wisdom? Who's it? What's it really about? And it is not, you know, and I have my concerns and you have your concerns and I pray to God about a lot of things, but really, you know, we are the moment you are eternal. You know? It's, it's about that God, and what a unique, you know, God, Psalm 139, God formed us in our mother's womb. God wanted us to be born. And then God has wanted to save us. He sent his son here to, to save us. And God wants to use us for his glory, which is a privilege. It's an amazing thing. And I've always kind of had this struggle in this prayer in some ways. Because you're starting out saying, our father, which is really a good term, right? Man, what an amazing thing to call God, father. And if I was fashioning the prayer, I would think, our father, come here. Help me. But actually, Jesus says what the prayer is, is that you recognize that God is your Father. And rather than God coming in, I don't, you know, rather than God coming in wallowing with us in our self-pity, it's our Father which art in heaven. It's God lifting us up out of that. It is not wrong to go to God with a problem. But if we walk away from our prayer and we're still just as much distraught as when we started praying something went wrong maybe we didn't really express our problem to God we were not honest with God 
Maybe we did not put it back under the authority of God. Or maybe we did not even pray long enough and be silent enough for God to speak. You read through the Psalms. Many of the Psalms are the, are the prayers of David or Asaph or, or whoever. And if you read many of the Psalms, you start their prayers. And they start out in, you know, oh, woe is me. What am I going to do? They all hate me. My enemies are against me. And right, the, they start out in all that kind of way. Poor me. But then the Psalms end in a, but thou art God. And I will trust in the, you know, Lamentations chapter 3. You know, it starts out Lamentations, Jeremiah. Lamentations means weeping, mourning. He's in sadness. The nation of Israel himself. Lamentations chapter 3, he starts out with, you know, like, oh, what are we going to do? And the people are destroyed and the city's destroyed and they're beating me up. And he's in all of this kind of stuff. But then suddenly he has a revelation from God. And, and Jeremiah says, this I called, recall to mind, therefore I have hope. It is of the Lord's mercies we're not consumed. And he, and he ends with, great is thy faith. You see what I'm saying? And so Jesus, God has not given us this, this pattern to just say, okay, now listen, I'm God and you owe it to me to pray in regards to me. No, I don't think it's just that. I think that Jesus is saying the answer to your prayer is bringing it back into perspective that God is God. And letting, you know, I, the prayer of Jesus, Now I don't want to say too much here because I want to preach on this sometime. But right, Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and what's, how's he start out? Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And, I mean, he's struggling. And he gets up and I, personally, I kind of think that Jesus, I think he's like, you know, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. But apparently he's still struggling because he does what? He goes back and he prays again. He gets up, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And then what does he do? He goes back and he prays again. But the third time he stands up and he never, he never cries out for help. He, he is, he's, he's strong. He prayed it through. He put his life back in the proper perspective. And prayer is what did it for Jesus. Paul had a thorn in the flesh. Oh, God, remove this thorn. And then I think Paul probably even tried to bargain with God. Oh, God, if you just remove this thorn, then I could just serve you so much better. And he tries to reason through it. And, you know, Paul prays about it, what, three times. And I think the first two times, Paul gets up, you know what, Jesus still hasn't said anything yet. Why? I think Jesus is trying to say, come on, Paul. We've got to get beyond this temporary. Paul, we're all going to die one day anyhow. Come on, I got more. Come on deeper, deeper, Paul. Until eventually the Bible says that Paul gets to the point to where he says, I will glory in my pain. I will, I will boast when I am weak because I've learned that when I'm weak, then I can be strong through Christ. Paul prayed it through, but he had to get that heavenly perspective on his life. As you look through the first part of this prayer, I think it really, let me just kind of summarize this first part. I could take it apart piece by piece and, and preach many, many messages. But I, wanna, I want us to see the overlying principle, perspective here. And the contrast, again, I point out to you. When you pray, verse 2, say, our Father which art in heaven. What's about that? What's that about? Well, I think, one, that Jesus is trying to make this connection for us that you know, think about what it would say if he'd said it in some other way. You know, uh, most grand celestial omnipotent God. Of the well, God would be, I mean, and all that's true. But God would be so like, you know, I can't even talk to you. And it's, it's really kind of amazing that Jesus says that you can start out with our Father which art in heaven. He's emphasizing the fact that when you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you become a child of God. And so prayer is a conversation between a child and their father. You know, 
And what a blessed truth it is to think that you, you and I, we, we can call God Father. You know? But it's at the same time, Jesus wants us to understand that, that God is not just wanting to, you know, to just come and wallow in whatever it is that we're wallowing in, the self-pity or whatever it is, our Father which art in heaven. We're praying to the, what, a, what an amazing thing. These are, it's like on two opposite ends. On the one hand, you're calling God Father, but on the other hand, He's the one that's created all things. What a, what a, what a blessing for us to be able to do that. And you know, I don't think that, uh, I don't, you know, I don't always say Father. Maybe I should. I don't always say Father when I pray. I, you know, Lord, I use many terms. and I don't think it's wrong. But maybe I ought to use Father more. Maybe I ought to just really stop and concentrate and let that sink in, what it means that God is my Father through Christ. Our Father, which art in heaven, what? Hallowed be thy name. A reverence. Not only in a relationship with God, but then when we come to God, there should be a reverence before God. This is one of the reasons why I really struggle so much to when people refer to God as the man upstairs. I'm sorry, I just struggle with that. If you do it, I don't want to, I don't want to make you mad, but I struggle with that. Because God is not a man. He is God. And when God invited Moses into his presence, he said, take your sandals off. You're on holy ground. And so therefore, we should be careful. I don't think that God is going to honor prayers to where we're trying to bring God down to our level. No, prayers, God giving us the privilege to be brought up to his level. Hallowed be thy name. What does that mean? The word hallowed means treated as sacred or holy. The Bible tells us one of the commandments is that we should not take God's name in vain. Obviously, it, it is wrong to, to, to use God's name as a curse word, uh, to use Jesus as a curse word, or to, in my opinion, it is wrong to say, oh my God, dear, oh good Lord. And it's easy to follow it, but listen, Brethren, we're talking about God. And maybe we would see God honoring us more if he saw us honoring him. Hallowed be thy name. And I think that really the name, I thought about what is the name here? So does that mean I'm not supposed to use God and say, you know, my God or good God or whatever? Is that what it means? Well, it could mean that. But, you know, as I thought about this, what is the name? I've always struggled. What, how would be thy name? What name? God? Father? Jesus? And here's where I'm at in this. When, when Moses, when God invited Moses into his presence there with the burning bush, and, and, and Moses then, God gave to instructions to Moses what he was supposed to do. And Moses said, okay, when I go to the children of Israel and I tell them that God is going to deliver them, and they say, well, what, which God? Why were they going to ask that? Because there were thousands of God in the Egyptians. And they say, which God? God told Moses that his name was what? I am that I am. Yahweh, Jehovah. What does that mean? What does it mean? Why, I mean, why didn't God could have called himself anything? God could have revealed, a name reveals the character of God. Why did God, when God wanted to reveal, this is who I am, why did he say it to Moses, I am that I am? What does that mean? It means I am eternal. It means I never change. It means I am self-existent, independent of everything. I am God. And I really believe, in my, in my, where I'm at in this, the way I'm applying it, is that when I come to God, 
and when I hallow his name, I think that I need to take a few moments and I need to just concentrate on who it is I am praying to, who he is. He is eternal. He is independent of any earthly circumstances. He is the beginning and the end. He has all the wisdom, all the power. He deserves all the glory. He is God that I'm talking to. And yet, he tells me I can call him Father. Does that amaze you? That you can call this power Father. And so there's a reason why Jesus is teaching us to pray because, there, you know, he didn't want us to go to prayer. You know, you guess you go to prayer with problems, but, but if you go to prayer with problems and you get up and you still got the problems and nothing has changed, why even pray? But if you can go to God and pray about it, and you can know that God speaks, you want to go back and pray. I was, uh, this week I was studying on, I've had experience twice here over the last few weeks. As I've been studying about all of this, the Holy Spirit has led me to two different passages of Scripture that I've not used in a message, but I knew that through this, that the Holy Spirit was revealing things to me. And it is, <laughs> praise God. I've experienced God. The other morning I was, I was thinking about all this and I was studying on all of this. And actually, you know, the phrase there, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and forever, amen. And I thought, all right, I know that that is a quote from the Old Testament. I think David said it or maybe Solomon. I'm not for sure. So I had to search to figure out, find out who said it. And I discovered that David said it in First Chronicles chapter 29. And so I read chapter 28. i tell you what I did, you know, for whatever, if you can learn something from it. Because I'm trying to find places to where I can just, you know, I think, okay, I can just totally just go and get away from everybody. You know, Jesus had to get up for daylight. And if you're going to hear from God, you've got to get in solitary. You've got to get alone with God. And so what I've been doing here lately, and maybe I shouldn't tell this, I've been coming here and I've just been going to right here because I like that sunlight coming in. And so I just get, I just lay down right there. And, I, and the other day I came in and I brought my Bible with me. And I brought some in case God gives me something and I write it down. But I just came in here and I just laid down on my face. And I thought, you know, before I start praying, I need to get in the right frame of mind to pray. You know, each morning before I pray, I read a couple of chapters of Scripture. Because if I don't, I'm praying on a holy level. I want to get on a heavenly level. And so I have to read scripture to get me up there to that point. I have to be reminded of eternal truth. And so I thought, oh, I'm going to read these passages here. I'm just going to try to read these chapters and just see what it is. Let me, let me read you something. The part of David's prayer. You, you just list, close your eyes and listen to this and see if it would affect you as you'd pray. Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You're exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and to give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. I read that. And I'll tell you something, man. I prayed with authority to God. I prayed with confidence. 
I prayed with boldness, thinking this God has invited me to come and call him Father. And I laid up my knees before him. I prayed about things. And I prayed about for some of you in some situations that the Spirit brought to my mind. I prayed about those things. And after I prayed about those things for a few minutes, I was praying and I thought about this. And I stopped praying. And I kind of just went up on my knees and I just started praising. That's when you know God is there. And the sad thing for us is that we've got our prayers into this kind of this ritual and we fit it into everything else, you know, and we're praying while we're, you know, whatever else we're cooking. And there's nothing wrong. You ought to be praying while you're cooking, but surely to goodness, he's worth more and you need more. There are some people in this room that you need to hear God speaking to you. Because if you don't, life's going to eat you alive. The enemy is going to eat you alive unless you hear God speak to you. And God wants to speak to his children. He's the one told us to pray. And prayer is a part of his bringing us to himself. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. What is a kingdom? A kingdom is a realm where the king reigns. What are we praying when we pray, thy kingdom come? Well, I obviously, I'm praying for a day when, you know, where righteousness will dwell therein. You know, I'm praying for that day when, when Jesus puts all enemies under his feet and you know, this world we see today, it is so crazy, so evil. And so I'm praying for the coming of, the, of this kingdom when Jesus puts under rule all, you know, he's, he's God, Lord over everything. But I'll tell you somewhere else where I'm praying for the kingdom. I'm praying for the kingdom in this room. I'm praying for us as a church to be brought under the authority of the king. I'll tell you somewhere else where I'm praying for the kingdom. Right here. Because I have come to realize that if Jesus is not king right here, then I have no reason to expect him to be king here or king out there. Here's where it's got to start, brethren. Thy kingdom come. Thy will. What does that mean, thy will be done? It means your pleasure, your desire, your plan, your purpose. Sometimes when we pray this self-centered, egocentric kind of prayer, it's about us. Sometimes when we pray that kind of, what we're doing, we're praying about our kingdom. And it is not about God building up our kingdom. It's about us being invited to become a part of him as he's building his kingdom. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. God's will, your plan, your purpose in our life as it is in heaven. I want to tell you one more thing and I'm going to conclude. It's kind of interesting. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done are all in verbs and in, in, in imperatives. You say, what does that mean? Let me don't don't check out on me yet. It's very important you and I understand this. They're all imperatives. What does that mean? Well, an imperative sometimes can be a command. And so, in some ways, here's what Jesus, Jesus is telling us to say to God, glorify your name. Establish your kingdom. Your will be done. He's telling us to command that to God. Isn't it something? What a different prayer. When is the last time you ever prayed that? An imperative can mean a command, but it can also mean something that is a necessity. It has to happen. God, your name must be glorified. God, your kingdom, not my kingdom, not man's kingdom, not America's kingdom, your kingdom, your will be done. 
but it means something even more. When Jesus is telling us to pray in this kind of way and, and expressing it as an imperative, it denotes a sense of urgency. We want it more than anything. It must happen. God, do whatever you need to do to cause it to happen. When I was in school preparing for the ministry, I, you know, you have certain teachers. Some teachers, you know, you, you like, they are really, really cool. You really, really like them. And then some teachers is like, you know, where are you? You know, you don't. Well, I had this guy for a teacher in two different classes. And to be honest with you, when I first, first class, he was so off the wall that he frightened you. You know what I'm saying? He, he just kind of scared you. He had such a different view on everything. And he didn't mind telling you what his view was either. He was pretty authoritative in it. And so the first time I went through, I was like something world history, something like that. I didn't get into it at all. Then I had him for another class. And then he was one of those kind of guys, you either loved him or you hated him. And I kind of started out, I don't say I hated him, but I just didn't like him. But the longer I sat under that man's teaching, the more I came to love him. Because I realized that he was a little bit raw, but he was telling the truth. And he used to pray a prayer in class that the first few times he prayed it, I thought, oh, no, 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 don't, don't pray that. His prayer would be, God, do whatever you need to do today to cause us to have fellowship with you. And the first time he prayed that prayer, I thought, you understand what you're saying? You know? I mean, that could mean bad stuff. Don't pray that. And he kept praying it. And I started thinking, what am I afraid of? What am I afraid of being caused to want God? And I began to kind of embrace that. And you know, Sometimes when we pray, if we make it all about ourselves, what? We want, we want, you know, God, fix this. Fix this so that I can keep going about my kingdom. And sometimes God does fix it. But sometimes God says, no, that is not my plan to fix it. It is my plan to be glorified in and through you, even through this problem. Your problems are part of the kingdom. So I want to ask you a question today as Pastor Bruce comes and plays for us. Are your prayers kingdom prayers? Which way are you praying for Christ to come and to solve your problems and fix your life so that it can be simple and easy? Or are you willing to take a step of faith and to just let God be God? Maybe even let Him use your problem in a way to magnify Himself.